Good evening and welcome to the Shine Dome. My particular welcome to Ambassador Her Excellency Fafioli. Welcome to the Shine Dome. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, thank you so much for being here. We're absolutely delighted to be able to host the public again in this beautiful um, and architecturally and scientifically significant building. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here this evening. I'd like to commence by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people traditional owners of the land on which the Shine Dome and the Australian Academy of Science is built. I'd also like to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be with us this evening. We are, of course, live here in the Shine Dome, but this event is also being live streamed across the world. Anyone can participate, so uh, we welcome all of our audience. We are absolutely delighted uh, that you could join us, and should you be watching this event, after the event happens as a recording, uh, thank you. We really welcome your participation. I'll go through some housekeeping. I'd like you to put your phone on silent, but don't feel you need to turn it off. In fact, we'd encourage you to share your experience about the wonderful speakers and this event uh, uh, this evening on social media on whatever platform you may wish, acknowledging the Italian Embassy, the Institute of Culture and the Australian Academy of Science. In the unlikely event of an emergency, you will hear some bells ring. The exits are on either side of you, and we ask that we, you make your way out through any of the doors and towards the car park that is between this building and Ian Potter House, and that is the assembly area. Later this evening, you'll be able to ask questions, so listen intently and scribble them down. If you're here in the audience, uh, there are microphones set up to your left where you'll be able to ask questions. We ask you to wear a mask when you're asking a question at the microphone. And if you're online, you'll be able to ask questions by going to science.org.au backslash Q and A, and that A is an ampersand. And if you're on the live stream, you'll be able to see a link to that shortly. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Essa Anna Maria Fioretti, the scientific attaché from the Italian Embassy of Italy. Um, unfortunately, this is Anna Maria's final event as scientific attaché, uh, so it is bittersweet for us. We're absolutely delighted to be able to host you here at the Shine Dome, um, but very sad that you'll be leaving us uh, to return to Italy. But um, putting that to one side, let's enjoy the evening, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Anna Maria Fioretti. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. Distinguished guests, excellence, members of the Academy, dear friends, <coughs> welcome to this first Italian night jointly organized by the Embassy of Italy, the Istituto Italiano di Cultura di Sydney, and I wish to uh, thank the director. Dilo Guarneri for being here with us tonight, and the Australian Academy of Science. Tonight, five passionate and distinguished scientists coming from five different universities in Italy, Bologna, Genoa, Milan, Naples, and Rome, and now working here in Australia in five different institutions, will lead us across the inexhaustible amount of complexities of the long journey of human mission to Mars and back to Earth. They will introduce us to the nature of the space that fills the universe, that is not as empty as we might think. They will talk about the many hazards and dangers that astronauts are exposed when leaving our well-protected terrestrial environment and traveling interplanetary. They will also tell us about their studies to help protecting astronauts during their trip to Mars and about the biomedical application on Earth. And once, eventually, after months of dangerous traveling in space, astronauts will have, say, once, once they have safely reached the Red Planet, we will see why landing and re-entry to the Earth is still an open engineering challenges. challenge. All this without forgetting that human beings are used to eat. And providing first protein could be another challenge for them, as it is becoming a challenge for our growing wild, uh, world population. But before introducing you, our scientists, our first stars, 
as we are speaking about space. It is my great pleasure to invite Her Excellent Francesca Tardioli, Ambassador of Italy to Australia, to open this interplanetary night. Taking, uh, taking place, yes, I'm sure you have noticed this, we are in the Martian Embassy. So, this is really the right place to be for this kind of round table. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ana Maria. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Arabia, distinguished panelists, distinguished guests here in presence, but also those who are following this event online. Thank you for your presence, for your attendance, and welcome. It's a great, really great pleasure for me to be able finally to attend to this event that was, it's, uh, that was uh, conceived to happen a few months ago, but it has to be uh, postponed due to the COVID uh, situation. Um, this uh, event was part, and is, I would say, part of uh, the Italian Embassy program of, uh, let me call it, outreach, sensitization discussion towards COP26 throughout the entire year and actually starting in 2020 together with uh, the United Kingdom in particular as co-president, co-presidency of the COP26 but also together with many other embassies and stakeholders and members of the international community, we have worked very much putting forward ideas, uh, discussions, organizing events, to think together, to talk together about what else we can do to help protecting this planet, first of all. Because it's great to go to Mars, and I'm really looking forward to hear from, from you, distinguished panelists. But it is equally very important to remind ourselves that there is no planet B, no planet B like Earth. So why this event in this contest? For the reasons that Anna Maria highlighted a few minutes ago. Um, journey, a journey, interplanetary journey, a journey to Mars does pose a lot of challenges and requires also a lot of creativity, a lot of science and inventive to overcome those challenges. Um, and so we believe that we might find inspiration, we might also learn how to, for instance, enhance uh, sustainability, the concept itself applied to food, but also on other aspects of our daily lives, but through the experience that sciences have to go, um, and in order to make these uh, uh, trips to Mars doable. So we see a lot of benefit in exploring new frontiers, not imposing no limits to science, but also with, um, within you know, the perspective that I've tried to highlight. Uh, how this can help also to protect Earth, our planet. One other important element that you know, inspired us to put this event together is the great Italianity of this group of people. Um, all of them working in Australia, some of them Australian citizens, but you know, with this commonality, all of them are Italian. They have learned they have studied, they took their degrees in Italy, and, and now they work here in, in Australia. And for me, this is one of the most beautiful, actually wonderful examples of the strength of the collaboration between our two countries, Australia and Italy. So it is also a way to celebrate the added value of such uh, cooperation, broadly speaking, and the added value of these excellencies that we do have in the Italian scientific system that are now here working in Australia, with Australia. That is also, you know, a great place to work because it that puts at the disposal of those scientists means that are necessary to continue their, um, their activity. 
Um, you see also here a nice uh, symbol, aria, which you know resonates like an Italian word, air. It's the association of Italian researchers in Australia. Um, just to, I mention this because we don't have only these five stars. Those are really this is really a stellar planet, but panel because they have do recover uh, very prominent positions already. But there are many, many, many others, uh, young, younger perhaps, uh, junior uh, Italian researchers, men and women, who do uh, work in Australia. And that's another important asset for me. So it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to mention this association. Last point, and I'll stop here because I think I have already gone for my five minutes. You will see also the very prominent presence of women in this panel, and this is also something that I'm very proud of. Talking to the president of the this Academy of Science, who is a woman, uh, I think this is also extremely important to underline the uh, 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 gender balance, gender equality that those scientists do have when they come to work in Australia. So that's another element that, as a woman, I think it's important to mention. I'll stop here. I look forward to hear from you. And uh, for those who are here in the room and for those who are following us in, uh, in via BTC, um, don't, don't leave immediately because after the, the panel, there is a little surprise. Uh, that involves uh, uh, Dr. Ana Maria Arabia. I will not tell you more now, but stay with us. Thank you. But... Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your continuous support to this event and many others, and for your nice words for the Italian community working here. And now it is my pleasure to briefly introduce to you all of our panelists, and before they talk about the long journey to Mars, I'd like to ask them to say some words on, the prof on their professional journey that brought them from Italy to the Martian Embassy, meaning here in Australia. And uh, so, uh, at my right hand side, Professoressa Elisabetta Barberio, she is the director of the ARC Center of Excellence for on dark matter particle physics. She was awarded in, nine, in 2018 the Australian Water Boss Medal for Physics and in 2013 the Women of Science Lecturer by the Australian Institute of Physics. So, Elisabetta, two minutes for you. So, thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. So I was born in Italy. I'm Italian and I think my accent is still quite thick and quite uh, audible. Um, I'm an experimental particle physicist, so my research is a fundamental research. I'm working at the University of Melbourne. I graduated my undergrad in the University of Bologna. Then I did my PhD in Germany, my first postdoc in Israel, and then I moved up CERN in Geneva. I work at the Large Hadron Collider experiment there. And then in 20, uh, sorry, in 2004, yes, in 2004, I joined the University of Melbourne, where I'm still there. And then, at a certain point in 2014, something happened. Uh, there was uh, a signal for something we call dark matter in Italy that is quite persistent. And so we started a joint adventure, also supported by the scientific attaché of uh, the, the Italian embassy that started an adventure to, to build the first underground physics lab in the southern hemisphere and the first dark matter data detection experiment in the southern hemisphere. So now we are in the middle of this um, adventure. It's not, it's not going to Mars, but it's exploring the universe in a different way. Thank you very much, Elisabetta. And Susanna Bertelli, associate professor of the School of Physics at the University of Wagon. She has been awarded this year Women in Physics Lecturer by the Australian Institute of Physics. Good evening. Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. Um, I started my career following my curiosity, really, to understand how the universe uh, works. 
And I think I had the great role models. Uh, my father is a physicist uh, teacher. Uh, I had a great uh, teacher in physics at school and I, I had my degree in physics at the University of Genova. But my career really uh, started when uh, I joined, uh, um, I, uh, I was a technical student at SORN in 2002. And um, yes, I started my career uh, in SORN and I am an expert of radiation physics for, for biomedical applications from uh, radiation protection down to improve uh, cancer treatment by means of radiotherapy. So uh, after then I did my PhD uh, in um, support, uh, founded by the European Space Agency. My PhD was in uh, radiation protection of astronauts in missions to Mars in the Aurora project of ESA. Uh, after, and I was based at SORS team. Then after my PhD, I've been a postdoc at INFN in Genova and then I started my Australian adventure. Um, I joined the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization. I've been their a postdoctoral fellow for a couple of years and finally I moved to the University of Wollongong and now I'm associate professor there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susanna. And now I'd like to introduce Stefania Peracchi, who is a researcher at the ENSTO, and she is the winner of first prize People's Choice Award for the three main phases Asia Pacific competition. So you must be very synthetic generally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yes, I'm Stefania. I'm from Milan, and I did my studies in Milan at the Polytechnic of Milan. I'm a nuclear engineer. And after my master, I decided to move to Paris, where I worked for a couple of years in an in institution of radiation protection and nuclear safety. There, my project was focusing on uh, the radiation protection of uh, pilots and aircrew members in, uh, in aviation. And after a couple of years, I, I received a call from a professor in, uh, in Milan that asked me if I wanted to join a PhD project in Australia. So I decided to, to come and to, let's say, increase my knowledge in cosmic radiation starting from aviation to, to space. So that's why I joined Susanna, which is my ex-supervisor at the University of Wollongong. And I, I did my PhD there. So for three years I, I work and I studied this detector that I'm going to talk about. And after the end of the, the PhD, so just like at the beginning of this year, I, I got a job at ENSTO. So same uh, institution where Susanna worked as well. And I'm currently an accelerator scientist. So my, my job uh, involves the use of accelerator, particle accelerator, to study the effects of radiation on electronics and biological samples to see what's the effects on those uh, particular things uh, when, they, when we launch them in space. Thank you very much, Stefania. And uh, Luaco has arrived one year ago, more or less. Two. Two already, <laughs> two years ago. And he is the manager of the National Space Test Facility at the Australian National University, so he is home here, and he works at Mount Stormer. So, good evening to everybody. And uh, I am a mechanical engineer, and uh, I have studied uh, initially and worked for development of hydrogen technologies, uh, starting from fuel cells, so probably now we are much more uh, in tone with the COP26 uh, goals. And uh, I worked in that field many years, and then I started to work also in experimental aerodynamics, that is the science that study the object re-entering into Earth atmosphere from space, and so like space shuttle and uh, or uh, other vehicles. And uh, I have worked 20 years uh, in that field, and at the end I have, uh, I was the uh, uh, test engineering leader of the world largest facility for uh, testing of thermal protection system for space vehicle that is located in uh, Italy, in South Italy. And then uh, a couple of years ago I decided to move here to Australia to find out more opportunities and, uh, and uh, to, let's say, contribute to the boost in the space industry that is happening right now here in Australia, and, uh, notwithstanding the COVID. Thank you very much, Eduardo. <coughs> and last but not least, Federica Turco. She is an entomologist with more than 20 years of experience in scientific research, and she is the manager of the Australian National Insect Collection 
in CSA World here in Canberra. And I visited the collection and I invite and I invite them to go and visit <laughs> because it's so beautiful. It's really something special and unexpected. It was unexpected for me to find. So thanks Anna Maria. Maybe <coughs> not all at once, but <laughs> in small bits. So thank you for inviting me. Obviously in this panel I'm the one with the feet much more on this planet. Um, but obviously being a scientist, the interest and curiosity is, is in all of us. Uh, and, uh, and there are some applications in ecology that I will talk about. But I'm very much interested in, uh, in biodiversity, biodiversity description and uh, evolutionary um, uh, processes uh, on this planet and their use also in terms of conservation. I was born and raised in, in Rome. I've done my studies uh, and postgraduate studies in, in Rome at the University of Madrid and uh, with a project of the, um, trying to understand the evolutionary pathways and the variation of uh, um, MP, um, of, uh, of a group of insects living in the Mediterranean area. After my PhD, I decided to move to Australia because I thought and I still think that Australia, for someone interested in biodiversity and evolutionary biology, is the place to be. Um, so I moved to Brisbane first, where I've done my nine years of work there, um, postdoctoral research. And also in my years at the Queensland Museum, I've also started to get a lot of interest in, uh, in the actual management of uh, research collections and phonological collections that I've worked for in for 20 years in Europe and in Australia. So then five and a half years ago, in 2016, I took on the role that I'm currently in uh, with CSRO on Black Mountain, across the road, <laughs> the other side of Queen's Cross. And, uh, and as Anna Maria said, it's a, it's a large collection. It's an important reference for research in Australia and, um, and overseas. And uh, it's a job that I'm very proud of. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now that we know all the speakers, it's time to <coughs> have their research and their science. And I will also have a little bit here. Actually, we have a slightly large number of Anna Maria in the room, more than I'm <laughs> used to. <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction. I'd now like to invite Professor Elisabetta Barbiero now to deliver her presentation. Each of the speakers will speak for five to six minutes. So if you have any questions, jot them down and we'll take them all at the end, but don't forget them, we really, really would like to hear them. Uh, over to you, Professor Papier. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm a little bit short, so I'm going to disappear without the podium. But I'm trying to get there. So my research is a little bit, you know, we go from uh, being an entomologist to something that is very, much more big scale and much more really quite off earth. So my research is trying to ask the question what the universe is made of. And it seems a quite obvious question because we know what we are made of, earth and planet. But then I would say that maybe what is the most uh, um, incredible discovery of this century and by the end of the last century is that ordinary matter, the matter we are made of, you know, earth, planets, stars, galaxy, it's just only 20% of the matter of the universe. The remainder 80% is something that we don't know what it is. We know that it doesn't emit light. This substance is what we call dark matter. We know it exists because without dark matter, galaxy will not be able to stick together. We will not exist, but we don't know what it is. So I started this big journey that involved many people in a center of excellence in Australia to understand what is the nature of dark matter. And there is also a lot of, as I say, collaboration with Italy to do this, this, this part. So where do we start? Well, we can start a little bit large scale to our galaxy. So this is the picture of what we would see our galaxy if we are outside the galaxy. And so this is the part, the, the white part, which is the star and the gas and the planet we see. And then you can see this, and this blue kind of halo, the temple of the galaxy, that extend much, much, much more than the galaxy. And this is the dark matter that envelops our galaxy, and it's everywhere in our galaxy. And this is 80% of the matter of the galaxy. So if we think about Earth and Earth around the sun, as the sun goes around, 
the center of the galaxy, it passed through this sea of dark matter that come to us and can be seen on Earth as a kind of wind, you can see that center plane on Earth, and this dark matter passed through us all the time. So if we want to understand what is this mysterious matter, we don't need to go to Mars, we don't need to go anywhere, we need just to be on Earth, put in our detector, and then collect all the dark matter that reach us. Just to give you an idea of uh, what's going on, every day we have about a billion of dark matter particles passing through our body. The issue in building some kind of detector instrument to see dark matter is that only a handful of these dark matter particles that pass through our body interact with our body. On the other hand, we have all these other particles that come from the sun and the stars around, called um, cosmic ray, that are the particles we are made from, the neutron and other star, they are about 10 billion a day, they reach Earth, and almost all of them interact with our body. So you can see that the detector on Earth would be very difficult to see the dark matter. However, we have a catch that if we go underground, only a handful of this cosmic ray reach, for example, one kilometer underground, while dark matter is not blocked by the rock because by the nature of dark matter do not interact very much with normal matter. And so if we want to see dark matter, we need to go one kilometer underground and we are building the first underground physics lab in, uh, in the southern hemisphere in a working mine, it's not an abandoned mine, in Stoll in Victoria, in the Stoll Gold Mine. And this is where we are with the lab. This is one of the latest pictures that is going to get together. This is not a small lab. It's 30 meters long and 12 meters high. It's just that it seems small because everything is big inside. And with this uh, lab, we try to understand dark matter. How do we know that we discovered dark matter? We exploit, as I said, the fact that the sun goes around the galaxy, Earth goes around the sun, and this wind of dark matter that, that passes through Earth at 800,000 kilometers per hour reach Earth, and you can see that depending where Earth is with the position on the sun, this dark matter wind can be a tail tailwind or a headwind. So the number of particles of dark matter that reach Earth change in December and June. And if you count how many of these particles come in your experiment underground and you see a difference that is corresponding to this velocity, this phenomenon we call modulation, you nil dark matter. And there is one experiment in Gran Sasso here in Italy, you can see here, and this is the, uh, the modulation that see a signal that is compatible with dark matter. And so there is a worldwide um, search for really understanding dark matter. However, to discover the signal of dark matter and confirm, we need experiment both in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. And you can see here that there are a lot of experiments and a lot of underground lab in the northern hemisphere, but only one in the southern hemisphere. So this laboratory here, it came like a kind of uh, the beginning of the story. There was a meeting here between two centers of excellence that was organized also with the support of the Italian Embassy and the um, scientific attaché, in which the, uh, the NFN, the vice president of the NFN and the director of the Grand Sasso on the ground lab came here and they thought that we could build in this mine an underground laboratory that could host this experiment to confirm or refuse the existence of dark matter. And then we are here the SABER experiment, that is the first dual experiment, dark matter direct detection experiment. That means it's an experiment that will have two sides, one in the northern hemisphere, in Gran Sasso, in the Laboratori Nazionali Sotterranei, you can see here is the tunnel between the joint L'Aquila to Teramo. And then here on the stall and the ground lab over here in Australia. And so, this is just an idea of, uh, it's not a small experiment, it's quite a complex and big experiment, and there are many components that we are building, and there is many components that goes to chemistry, mechanical engine, civil engine, and so on. And now the moment you say, we are in the middle of constructing the lab, and we hope to take data taking soon. And then, then from there, well, I would say that my research at the moment is such that we are taking part in a scientific revolution with this research about dark matter. 
that is changing the way we perceive cosmos and where we are with cosmos. We are not, you know, we are just a tiny part. Our Earth is a tiny part of a huge universe of which we don't know. So not only we don't have planet B, but it's really unique in a universe that is so big in which normal matter is only 20%, and of this 20%, there is only this planet. So this is where I am. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I would now like to invite Professor Susanna Guatelli. Thank you. So, Professor Barberio told you that these are really exciting times for space science. So now we go from dark matter to a um, human mission to Mars, which is uh, envisaged for the next uh, decade. Well, I tell you something, space is a has a very harsh radiation environment. Beyond our natural shield, which is our global magnetic field, well, uh, um, astronauts are exposed to a um, harsh radiation environment that can, that can cause hazard uh, to the health of the astronauts. We have solar particle events, which are unpredictable and emitted um, uh, usually during solar maximum activity, they can produce acute radiation effects from mild ones like nausea and vomit down to radiation sickness and eventually death. Then we have a background of galactic cosmic rays that instead produce a chronic effects. They increase the risk of uh, developing cancer and the risk of uh, um, having diseases to the central nervous and cardiovascular systems. These uh, sources are considered the most harmful for astronauts um, when they go to the moon and when they go to Mars. They are mainly protons, and then there are also nuclei of helium, and in the case of galactic cosmic rays, other heavy nuclei like carbon, silicon, iron nuclei. Emission to Mars, um, sorry, in a three years long mission to Mars, um, our estimates indicate that astronauts would receive a radiation dose that is about 10 times the radiation of six months on the International Space Station, and we would overcome the astronauts' career limit as set by the European Space Agency and NASA. Keep in mind, if we go to space, in one day, we receive, in first approximation, two, three chest x-rays per day. So what do we do? Do we send astronauts to space and we see what happens? Do they get superpowers like the Fantastic Four? Not sure. Our approach is a little bit different. There is a lot of international multidisciplinary research to understand better the interaction of cosmic radiation with matter in general and with the biological, with the biological tissue. We need to develop powerful radiation monitoring systems and also to develop shielding solutions to adopt in planetary shelters and in transfer vehicles. We need to be able to predict the radiation doses that the astronauts will uh, uh, receive. And, there is, and these are only a few of the topics of research. Experiments in radiation protection of astronauts uh, are done in uh, uh, high-energy accelerator facilities, like uh, this one, the NASA Space Radiation Lab. But these uh, facilities do not uh, manage to reproduce the complexity of the uh, space radiation environment. There are some experiments in space on the International Space Station and in, other, in some robotic missions. But as you can imagine, these uh, measurements are expensive, complex and difficult to reproduce. So what do we do? Let's see. <laughs> we use radiation physics simulations, our software tools that model particle interactions with matter and allow to us to answer to some scientific questions in a very cheap way. And we can model the complex radiation environment of space and we can predict some the doses that the astronauts will receive. 
One of these radiation physics simulation tools is called GIAN4, which is developed by a large international collaboration based at CERN, uh, counting more than 100 scientists. And he was uh, born at the end of the 90s uh, to describe uh, high energy physics experiments like uh, the ones of the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. In 2002, as I told you before, I was a technical student of CERN. And since then, I contribute to extend the GIAN4 to biomedical applications, to make it usable, to improve radiotherapy treatment, to improve nuclear medicine procedures, for radiation protection, for radiobiology. For example, we can improve the delivery of radiotherapy treatment. We can verify the treatment planning systems that we use to uh, define the treatment of cancer in hospitals. And we can study the effect of radiation in the biological uh, medium. And since 2002, this is my work <laughs> and covering more and more leadership uh, international roles in uh, the uh, community. Now I will show to you briefly what you can do with GEM4 for radiation protection of astronauts. And these results were obtained at the Center for Medical Radiation Physics of the University of Wollongong. Um, we modeled uh, these uh, astronauts with these detailed digital phantoms that model the astronauts, and we've set them up in the Columbus module of the International Space Station, and we calculate the dose, the radiation dose in these environments. We use the national computing infrastructure that is here in Canberra because our simulations are very computing intensive. Then we validate the simulation results against experimental measurements, in this case, uh, experimental measurements done in this uh, plastic mannequin, anthropomorphic mannequin that was in, set in the, uh, on the ISS in the Matroska project for more than one year. Once we understand the reliability of our simulation model, then we can use it as a predictive tool. And with uh, my student, we calculated uh, we calculated the radiation environment on the surface of the moon. We calculate the radiation dose in the astronaut. I studied uh, yes, shielding solutions to adopt on the moon. We, one of the ideas is to use regolith. So evaluated how regolith can, pro, can protect the astronauts. And finally, we can characterize novel radiation monitoring systems like the silicon microdosimeters developed in our uh, center. And this will be the uh, subject of the talk of uh, Stefania. So that's all, thank you. Um, and uh, usually people think uh, that radiation physics simulations are boring. I hope that today I give you an idea on which beautiful things you can do with these uh, software tools. Thank you very much. Anything but boring. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Uh, please welcome to the podium, Dr. Stefania Farak. Okay. So. Okay, so yeah, we understood from Susanna that prediction and understanding cosmic radiation is essential if you want to send. Uh, humans to, to the moon, to Mars, or just exploring space in general. But once we predict it, we need also to have a device, a detector that tell us exactly what, what's the level of radiation in space uh, to, to be sure that what we predicted is actually what we get. So during my PhD, I developed and I optimized this silicon mushroom, which is a, a, a detector that is used for radiation protection in space. So we understood which are the risk of this invisible hazard. So we have a dose in, in space, so if we go to Mars, which is 10 times higher than the one that we receive right now in the International Space Station, we have a probability of cancer that increase. And if we have this particular solar explosion during the way to Mars, uh, we can have a 50% of probability to die immediately. So that's extremely dangerous. And to do that, we need to keep track, once we have identified the issue, we can keep track of this radiation level. And to do so, we need this detector that um, detects in, in real time the level of radiation and can tell us if we are above or below the limits. And then eventually we need to try to find a solution. So countermeasures like improve the spacecraft design and find materials that can shield the, the, the astronauts inside the spacecraft better. 
But because during my PhD I couldn't do everything, so I just decided to focus on the second point, which is keep track and develop this kind of detector, which is called silicon mushroom detector. So what's the silicon mushroom? First of all, it was invented by distinguished professor Anatoly at the CMRP, and it was invented for medical applications, so to be used in, uh, radiation, in rad uh, radiotherapy and to monitor the level of radiation while we deliver uh, cancer treatment. But then we decided to see if it, it could have been actually sent to space. So first of all, it's a microdosimeter, so it's a radiation detector that has particular sensitive volumes that have a dimension of a biological cell. And that means that this cylinder represents a cell in dimension and composition, and we can study the effects of radiation for each singular cell that is exposed in space. It's called silicon on insulator because those sensitive volumes are made of silicon and they're made on this substrate. We place thousands of them, so we reproduce a little piece of human tissue. And then we call it mushroom because, I mean, we could find a little bit the resemblance of mushrooms in the grass. And that's the, the picture of our detector. It's very small, it's one by one millimeter, and is encapsulated with uh, electronics that made it portable. So we can think about like a badge that can put on the astronaut spacesuits. So once we had the prototype, we needed to test it to see if it was actually ready to, send, to be sent to space. So I went in different facilities around the world. And for example, here we have the irradiation room at IMAC in Japan. In this, in this uh, facility, we have an accelerator that produces particles which are similar in, of the, the one that we actually have in space. So we reproduce a scenario which is the same as, a, as the one of a spacecraft. So we place our detector behind a shielding sample, which is made of multi-layers of aluminum, Nextel, and, and Kevlar. And this represents our spacecraft. Then, behind the spacecraft, we need to have our astronauts. So we put a little bit of uh, a plastic that reproduces the same density and composition of the human body. And behind it, we put our detector. Then we irradiate it with the, the cosmic rays, and then we see what's the, what's the result, what's the dose to an astronaut, what's the, the type of particle, what's the, the danger. But also because that's what we can do on ground-based facility. We can't go to space every time we want to test a, a device, but we can do something particular, which is quite cool. So we can fly to the South Pole. And the South Pole is a particular place in, uh, on our planet where the magnetic field actually accelerates cosmic rays from the outer space, and it doesn't shield it. So if we fly there with a particular flight, and we bring our own detector on board, we can actually detect the real cosmic ray cosmic rays that an astronaut will actually encounter during a, a mission. So that's what I did. The, our detector worked. So now we just need to commercialize it and make it cool and send it to space. So if you have any question, I'm happy to answer later. Absolutely fascinating. And a reminder, if you do have any questions, please hang on to them. Don't forget them. There will be an opportunity for the audience here in the Shine Dome to ask them. For our online audience, you'll, you can ask your questions uh, by visiting science.org.au backslash Q and A, and that and is an ampersand. Now to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Eduardo Trifoni. The floor is yours. Slide. Okay. Yes, but ah, okay, yeah. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Referred to as the seven minutes of terror, because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are... Sorry about that. But...
Yes, just I want to introduce you this um, topic of the challenges to go to Mars and coming back, showing you what really we are doing, actually, with uh, sending a robotic mission to Mars. And this uh, footage is from uh, uh, the last mission that the United States uh, has sent to Mars with the rover uh, Perseverance. And uh, so I, I want to just highlight to you that the challenges are incredible. And I think this video is a very good exemplification. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror, because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmospheric entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from spacecraft, and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. It's the biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. If you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky crane maneuver. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. Surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. So I have another footage that showed the real mission, what happened really on the February 2021 with the mission. So it was successful. We have now a second rover that is one ton weight on Mars and is looking with the suite of instruments to the traces of past life on Mars. Because there is one important aspect that I think I want to highlight is something related to the COP26. So why we are so interested into Mars? Because Mars looks very much to the Earth without water. And we, have, we don't know why it happened. And uh, now the atmosphere is Mars is purely uh, carbon dioxide. And so it's like an heart after a catastrophic event. 
And uh, this is the reason why scientists are so interested into Mars. And so we have a lot of mission going there. And uh, we are looking at uh, traces of past life, if, if there was. And in, uh, in, our, uh, in our goal, uh, going with the astronauts is uh, absolutely a big challenge because the technology that you have seen, so critical, is suited for robotic mission. When you increase the weight, when you increase the, the dimension, and everything becomes incredibly complex, at the moment not available. So we are considering to land on to Mars with the thermal protection system that is deployable and uh, in some case also inflatable, but it's not yet available. So it has to be developed by new. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something it will, will take time, I, I'm pretty sure. There are other options uh, to land on Mars also with the retro propulsion uh, approach, like, you know, the first stage of SpaceX that now can land by itself. But there, there is other challenges that are related to availability of the fuel. Because, you know, a mission of about six or seven months going to Mars does not allow you to have the fuel to come back and to land safely onto Mars. So it is really challenging at the moment, and uh, there are many open questions, starting from the fact that when you approach Mars, you fly at 20,000 kilometers per hour, and so, and you need to stay then on ground after seven minutes at zero velocity. And really critical, I would say. Introducing Dr. Federica. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. So it sounds like, and it looks like, Eduardo has landed all of us on Mars, <laughs> or at least that's the plan at some point. I guess the next question for a lot of us, especially those people like me who are not professional in space science, um, is uh, how are we going to sustain ourselves? What are we going to eat? <laughs> <laughs> and that is a question that obviously is being asked also for you know, people uh, currently working and living for a long time in, in uh, International Space Station. So there is a need for humans to sustain themselves away from this planet. So there are options, but uh, one particular option I would like to focus on, mainly because, well, it's my area. <laughs> I'm an entomologist. But also because I would like to draw a little bit from what also Ambassador Tardioli uh, mentioned and the fact that, that um, work in space and work on Earth can reinforce each other and could bring benefit to each other. We heard something similar from Susanna as well with research on cosmic rays and what great benefit can also bring down to Earth to us. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about I can keep talking in the meantime. Um, so, what I'm going to 
to talk to you about is one particular option that we have to feed ourselves away from our planet, and that is algorithm. So using uh, protein that are sourced from insect farming in um, away from our planet, on, on, um, on a space station, or even, as it's been suggested in a paper published only a couple of years ago, on a human establishment on Mars. So, um, what is interesting is that insect farming and edible insects in an in, it's an industry on this planet, on our planet, that is uh, fast growing. It's been recognized in the food space, is the, is the area uh, that is, uh, um, is the industry that is uh, growing uh, so fast. And it's, uh, it's also an area where um, in, um, Australia itself is, uh, is trying to get in and, uh, and make its own uh, specific proposition in, that, in, this, in this industry. But what is interesting is that, that the more it becomes an option on this planet, the more it's also being considered as an option, as a food source for humans away from our planet. So there is an increasing body of, uh, uh, of evidence uh, um, about edible insects uh, uh, in, on our planet as an alternative complementary source of protein for human consumption. But there is also an interestingly um, increasing body of evidence around using insect farming and insect protein as uh, food for astronauts uh, and possibly in future for a human establishment on, uh, um, on Mars. Um, but what are the reasons why this uh, alternative protein is so interesting on our planet and also uh, away from our planet? I've got only one other slide um, if it comes up, yes, which is a very um, interesting and, um, and informative diagram that I've taken from that document that you see there in the corner, which is uh, an edible insect roadmap that CSRO has recently published, uh, and it's a roadmap to, uh, for edible insects industry in Australia. And actually, one of the two co-authors is here tonight. It's Dr. Brian Lassard, who's in the audience, uh, and he's one of the affiliates of the collection where I work on. And that's why I'm presenting uh, about this uh, today. Um, what I found really interesting in this document, as you can see, this diagram has been produced, putting together literature available that has been published. Um, and it puts together, as you can see, it's a comparison between less conventional uh, proteins compared to more conventional ones. So you've seen there for um, insects, we've got crickets and mealworms, which are two of the very few insect species that are commercialized at the moment on Earth. And you see a comparison for some uh, areas that are very critical, like uh, use of resources, like land, space needed for uh, farming these animals, or water, or even feed, so the, the food that we feed these animals um, with, and also greenhouse gases emissions. And as you can see in all the bars, the dark blue and the green for crickets and mealworms stand out for the very little resources that they need in terms of space, water, uh, feed, food, and also for the little amount of greenhouse gases that they produce. What is also very interesting is the productivity that this alternative uh, um, source of protein is showing. The last bar is a protein feed conversion efficiency, which means uh, how much of the food you feed the animal you're farming is then converted to food that is available to us for human consumption. And as you can see, in those two systems, crickets and mealworms, uh, the, uh, the conversion efficiency is very high. It's fi nearly 50% for both of them, compared to much lower in other more conventional protein. So, what is uh, the result or the, um, the consequences on our planet is that these systems are more and more becoming a convincing alternative for a complementary protein on this planet, where our resources are becoming more limited than what we have thought for a long time. 
when we think about a space station or even a bubble on Mars where humans maybe one day will live, it's easy to see how the resources are limited. It's easy to see how confined that space is. We need to start thinking that our planet is becoming a little bit more like that than what we think. So it's very interesting for me that uh, research on Earth is becoming compelling for providing humans with the, the, the proper support to explore the universe and the space around it. And also for me, it's very interesting to see how the lessons that are being learned around edible insects are providing some useful support on, uh, uh, on space missions or um, work on space stations. And at the same time, there is a clear potential for technolog uh, technological development in space that can be re-imported back to Earth to improve the current systems used to insect, for insect farming on our planet. So there's not much distinction between what we're doing on our planet and what we can do out of it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Over to you, our audience, to ask our wonderful panellists um, some questions. Uh, could I make one comment at the beginning? How fortunate are we in Australia to have attracted such extraordinary talent to our shores and for uh, these wonderful researchers to call Australia home and to have brought their expertise uh, to our nation. Um, but not only, uh, they have of course remained connected uh, to Italy and to many countries around the world as the essence of scientific collaboration. Um, uh, the scientific endeavour absolutely requires international collaboration. We're absolutely fortunate. Before I launch into questions, I'm going to ask you to put your hands together for all of the pan panellists this evening. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, I invite you to the microphone over here on the left. Um, I'll walk over in a moment and turn it on. Um, but to get us started, I have one for Elisabetta. Um, the Stoll Underground Laboratory you mentioned, um, it's, it involves a range of dis different disciplines. You said you, yes. required on, you require a range of experts. Can you talk to us about how those collaborations occur and the range of dif disciplines that are required to make that a reality? Um, so, in the Stoll on the Ground Lab, there will be a lot of discipline working together. So, there will be the discipline that come together to build this dark matter discovery machine in which there will be engineering. We have a large vessel. We have a space engineering because we have a vacuum vessel that we need to build that we need to put a lot of liquid scintillator, what we call this liquid that is this solvent that we need to see. And solvent has particular properties, so they can see particle, light, produce light when particle like the electron and the proton pass through, so we use it. We need chemistry because we need to create a, a crystal made of salt, salt crystal, sodium iodide crystal that it needs very pure with no radioactivity inside. And then uh, we have um, physicists that are all over the place, but all of, we have also a, chem a mini chemical plant there for our experiments. So there is a lot of discipline coming together in a collaboration and working together. And then there will be some other researcher coming in the underground lab. One is related to, I would say, radiation. As I say, there is all this radiation that comes on Earth, even if you're shielded by the magnetic field of Earth. And then uh, people ask themselves, what's happened to life? Because life evolved on Earth with all this radiation, with, I say, this 10 billion of particles reaching us every day on, on Earth. When we go underground and there are not this radiation disappear, and there are studies there that show something quite interesting, that a lot of radiation is bad, zero radiation is bad as well for the cancer, and... Uh, Radiation is very essential for the evolution of life. So the radiation we get from the universe, it was very important for life. We have seismography over there, people that are putting um, some equipment to understand how the tectonic plate where Australia is moved. We are moving about five or six centimeters a year, so we're moving quite fast. 
not in the right direction to go to Europe, but <laughs> uh, we're moving. And so this is another part that will be there. And then there is also what we call astrobiology. So there is a food science that goes underground in place that where life you do not expect exists because there is no oxygen or there is no light and uh, trying to do in the rock or grow bacteria or other form of life and see if they can live. So this is what we call astrobiology. If there is possibility of life outside the oxygen, light and other form. Fantastic. If there are any children watching and you've ever wondered why you should study science, that was the answer. <laughs> There's lots you can do with that. Uh, please feel free to make your way to the microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, Susanna, I have one for you and it, it's a follow on about radiation really. Uh, what are the main challenges in terms of shielding from space radiation in a mission to Mars? How do we overcome that? Yeah, the fact is that uh, the, what we have in space is a mixed radiation field of different uh, particles and with a very wide energy spectrum. So it's, um, it's very difficult to stop them using shielding solutions. And the research has showed that, that hydrogen-rich materials are better to shield. So polyethylene that you find in plastic grocery bags, or in this bottle, actually, it's a good, uh, it's a better um, sh passive shielding material, we call it. Because the, the problem is also that, especially galactic cosmic rays are high energy, and when they are incident on, on, a, on a target, uh, actually produce a secondary radiation field that can, through nuclear interactions. And this also can produce harmful effects uh, uh, to uh, astronauts. So uh, um, the solution that now is investigated more is uh, to um, complement um, passive shielding solutions of uh, polyethylene, let's say, and similar materials with active magnetic fields surrounding the transfer vehicle, so then uh, shield also from galactic cosmic rays. But then the crucial, most important factor is that we know, let's say, the effects of radiation of the Earth because, as you said, Elisabetta, we evolved here. So, uh, and we, uh, we have studies, uh, you know, uh, the knowledge that we have about the radiation effects in humans um, is, uh, uh, we have uh, the survivors of the um, yeah, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, we have data of uh, nuclear workers, survivors of uh, uh, cancer patients, but space radiation is very different and therefore there is a lot of research in the world and I do some of the research as well to understand which is the effect of cosmic radiation at the level of the DNA because this is crucial based on our current knowledge in a mission to Mars it's not clear if the excess lifetime risk to die because of cancer, because, uh, um, because of the exposure to ionizing radiation, we still do not know if it's a few percent, which is acceptable, or 20 percent. So as you understand, we need a lot of research, multidisciplinary research in physics, chemistry, biology, in order to answer to many questions. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I notice we have uh, somebody, if you could introduce yourself, and if the question is to a particular panelist, please say so. It might be for all of them. Yes. No, actually, my question is for everybody. My name is Vladimir. Uh, my interest is on an article that I read recently about the International Space Station that is actually reaching its end in the sense of they are finding cracks on it. And what is NASA doing? Well, a, a little bit stepping back and saying, hey, Mr. Tesla is ready to put out rockets. Mr. Amazon is putting rockets already out there. So how much these individuals, these institutions that are getting into the business of space are driving the new science? Are we going to let that? I mean, they, it seems to me that International Space Station was a, a vision of a lot of international scientists. But now, maybe it's enterprises who are leading the way. So how are we moving in that direction? And my one, one more comment is originally I'm from Mexico and in Mexico we eat crickets and a tequila without a worm is not a real tequila. So how much of the insect part is adaptability? And I'm saying this also because today or in the last weeks we have had an infestation of ants in the house and I eat my muesli with the ants, no problem, but my children cannot adapt to that. 
Thank you very much. Fantastic. Who'd like to take the first question? Eduardo. So regarding uh, how the private enterprise, enterprises can uh, contribute to the development of the space, it is clearly an important energy. I think they have uh, introduced the several breakthroughs in these few years, and the money comes uh, from the government of the United States, but just now they are not going directly into NASA. They are going into NASA that provide to these uh, private enterprises. So it's a different model of uh, managing this research, and I think it's providing incredible results. And uh, I guess for what concerns the International Space Station, it will arrive a time when probably we need to demise it, but I think there will be several countries that will help out and find the right solution, and I don't expect there will be any issues for the demise of the International Space Station. Thanks for your question, Vladimir. I, I loved it. Um, I know that, yes, your country is, uh, is one of the 130 countries in the world where insects are actually part of, uh, of the normal diet, the traditional diet. Australia is another one. Absolutely. And um, so in terms of that, yes, we, there is uh, uh, already on this planet, so there is a lot of uh, what is very interesting. It's a, it's a great variety of uh, approaches and a great variety of uh, acceptance towards including insects uh, on, on our diet. That is one of the three recognized challenges that this industry has. Um, there is uh, a bit more acceptance for things like insect flowers so that can be incorporated in foods. Uh, so there is a, a big body of work, which was also summarized in the roadmap that I was mentioning before, addressing those challenges. So, but yes, definitely, our countries are, uh, are traditionally uh, insect uh, eaters. Um, but when it comes to adaptability, the question is a little bit harder to, to, to answer because to, to, to answer about adaptability, we should know exactly what the kind of environment where you are introducing insects. So if we are introducing insects uh, in a space station or in a human establishment, my assumption is that in those spaces there are um, there is an environment, uh, atmospheric parameters that are acceptable for human life, uh, and therefore that would be a, a, you know, acceptable for, for insects uh, and plants and other systems that are being researched on and used on for, uh, for feeding astronaut currently. Um, if you're thinking about uh, potentially, because I've been asked that question, um, how insects would uh, be able to live on, on Mars. Well, uh, Eduardo told us what kind of environment is there. There is carbon dioxide and insects as much, you know, I love them and other people love them and how much tough they are. They are still um, based on oxygen respiration at a cellular uh, level. So they still require oxygen to survive. They may survive, I was talking about that previously with the panelists, they may survive in a, an adverse environment for longer than we do because they've got a tracheal system where they can keep um, you know, breathable air in their bodies for longer than we could. It's like having you know, your um, um, air bottles when you dive very similar to that, but at some point they will have to breathe and they can't breathe carbon dioxide. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask one moment of your patience because we have a question from our online audience. Uh, Dr. Paul Lennox asks, uh, Eduardo, why is the system to put rovers on Mars so complex? And there are quite a few online questions, so I'm going to have to limit your answers a little if I could. So it's so complex because we would like to land the rover in a soft way uh, because we, are, we want to protect the rover and their very expensive and sophisticated instruments. And so we need to make this very, let's say, futuristic landing, but it is the second time that we have done. And so we have already two rovers that has, has landed on uh, Mars soils in that way. And it works. 
Of course, uh, it works for those lenders. It is, does not work for human uh, mission. And so we need to find another solution. Fantastic. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very um, nice talk. Uh, so my name is Surinder Singh, and uh, I wanted to ask, because I'm a plant scientist, and you know, you mentioned the high concentration of carbon dioxide on Mars. So I was thinking, well, that's a perfect uh, food for plants, uh, and there's sunshine there, and if you can get some water, plants can fix carbon dioxide and then produce the food for um, just at least sustain people that are going to, you know, go to Mars. Uh, and also produce oxygen in, in, in the bargain. So do you know of work or research being done to see what types of plants might be useful for this uh, purpose? So definitely plants are very useful on that and have been very useful on that. When plants started to develop on and evolve on our planet, they dramatically changed our, our atmosphere and, and the gas that uh, composed our um, uh, atmosphere. But that was a natural evolutionary process. So introducing plants on another planet, uh, hoping that they will be able to make that change happen in, uh, on Mars uh, is a much more difficult uh, process as you can uh, um, imagine. Definitely plants uh, are able to, to convert CO2 in, uh, in oxygen and that's actually something that is being researched on in terms of uh, creating those bubbles that I was talking to you about before, whether it's a space station or a human establishment on Mars, and uh, the different um, food sources that are available are seen as uh, uh, part of an ecosystem, if you want, where there is plants that are able to do that conversion, there are insects that are going to be fed on uh, some parts of the, the non-edible plant uh, part of the plants from a human point of view. And it's, so it's tried to establish as a, a, a network uh, that will sort of, as much as possible, self-sustain uh, in the medium to long term. But in terms of changing the atmosphere of Mars, that goes beyond my expertise, I must admit. I'm not even sure whether oxygen would would stay, um, but that is for people more expert than me. Uh, but definitely on our planet, something similar happened. There was definitely way more carbon dioxide, and then algae evolved in the oceans, and, they, and that's where a big change happened, and that's where we are now. Thanks for the question. Any other contributions to that one? Oh, I'll go to the next one. I'll just go to one more online and then the floor's yours. Um, Tom, in our online audience, asks the panel, so whoever would like to answer this, the China space program is very expansive, but we hear little of it in Australia. What involvement does your program have with a, a China human Mars probe? Actually, is, uh, we know that the China's program is uh, heading to Moon, and so we do expect they will uh, launch a mission to Moon with uh, a crew, with, with people on board. But this is now competing with the effort from uh, United States and Europe to go to Moon uh, in the coming uh, years. And the uh, step towards uh, Mars is a different story. And uh, I think uh, the main difference is that Mars has an atmosphere. Instead, Moon has not an atmosphere. It's much easier to go to Moon rather than going to Mars. Thank you. Over to you. So my question is for Eduardo. Um, do you think that there would be a, a space station on Mars? And if so, it would, do you think it would be more complicated to launch? than the rover. Can I ask what your name is? Mar, M-A-R. Mar, thank you, Mar. So that's a nice question. And I would say you may expect soon a space station around the moon. So the international countries are working towards this outpost around the moon. And this will, uh, let's say, streamline the possibility of making mission to Mars 
because you know it's a sort of uh, place that is the let's say going to to Mars. Yeah, hopefully in, in a second future, I hope also a, a, an international station around the, the the Mars. Yeah, is that somewhere you'd like to work in the future? <laughs> and one more question from our online audience, and it's uh, to Federica. Is it possible to make a shield light and uh, effective for people? But I'm not sure if that should light. That might have been for somebody else. A shield light and effective for people. No, we'll skip that one. That's okay. Um, uh, I have a question uh, for Stefania. Um, why, the silicon, why is the silicon mushroom better than the other detectors? Okay, well, we already have some detectors on the International Space Station, but they're quite bulky. They, they're big, they need power supply. If they break, uh, it's, it's very difficult to like, find like, pieces to repair them. So our silicon mushroom is actually a powerful device because first of all, it's portable. So we can, as I said before, uh, put in a badge and just uh, hang it on the ast uh, astronaut spacesuits, so we don't need like a, a big ball uh, which is heavy and maybe needs to be connected to the power supply. And then in space, we don't have space uh, to to bring like big stuff, and we have like a limited amount of people that can uh, can work with it. So if we want to have many of the many detectors that can monitor all the spacecraft, we they need to be small. And then the second big advantage is that, as I said, those like um, detectors are made with very, very micron size uh, sensitive volumes, which are the, the little cylinder that detect the, rad the radiation, and they represent cells. So we can provide information to radiobiologists, for example, about the interaction that the radiation has with a human cell. So then once we, we study, we record the signal of these cosmic rays, we can pass information to radiobiologists and tell them, this is what is happening. Can you tell us what's the effect on the, on the astronauts itself? So they will then reproduce the same effect on a real cell, and they will eventually understand better the, the cancer risk, the damage to the DNA, and, and some other effects. Thank you so much. Our final two questions from the floor. My name is Yvette. I appreciate fully the application of the fundamental research that you're doing for the current human beings on this planet. But I wonder if all of you truly believe that within your lifetime, there will be a human mission to Mars and people will return thanks to Eduardo. I do think it will be. Also, I hope to have a long life, and so. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, I think it will be because you know uh, I think uh, we can remember all when the United States started to think about a mission to Moon. It was not very much time required to organize it. It was a very big uh, financial, uh, uh, let's say, yeah, operation. And uh, like uh, a mission to Mars is now rated in the order of hundreds of billions of dollars of investment. But I do expect that uh, we will see something in the coming uh, decades. I'm, I, I will be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Thank you. And our final question from the audience. Thank you. My, my name's Dave. Um, I'm old enough to have lived through the Gemini and Apollo projects and the excitement of those years um, and seeing the, the byproducts that came out of that, such as their non-stick uh, fry pans, was a byproduct from the research. And it's good to see your people like yourself doing lots of great research as a result of this type of program. But as we all know, the Apollo program was very politically driven uh, with, and once they had success, it all dried up. My question, sort of following on from the previous lady, is what do you think is the driver in the uh, global sense which will ensure that we will have success uh, in going to Mars and in a reasonable time frame? So there is another push on that, 
and uh, this is something that uh, the founder of SpaceX is repeating, is the sort of need or idea to become an interplanetary species. So I know this is pretty difficult to accept, but there is the possibility that uh, it could become a need to find another planet where to live. And so is Mars a possibility? And uh, even if there is uh, carbon dioxide in, the, in their atmosphere, this carbon dioxide can to split it into oxygen and uh, uh, carbon, and so it is a viable possibility. Other contributions? Yeah, um, I have my perspective. I like to do this kind of research because of the impact that this research has on our life on Earth. This, uh, because, for example, what I do develop, the more I understand the effect of cosmic radiation on astronauts, actually maybe we have a better understanding of, um, I don't, you know, maybe there is a proton therapy that is landing in Adelaide. It's a new cure to treat cancer, especially uh, important for pediatric patients. And uh, they use protons with an energy that you find also in the cosmic radiation. So the more we understand the effects of the cosmic radiation on the human beings, maybe the better we understand how to improve a cancer treatment on Earth. So I agree with uh, Eduardo. There is, uh, at the same time, and uh, there is uh, this, uh, uh, yes, there is also this aspect that is uh, to make our life more sustainable on Earth. Um, yes. With that, having returned back to Earth, um, thank you very much to our panellists and thank you to you, our audience, for your questions, those people participating here live at the Shine Dome and those uh, participating online. Please put your hand together for our wonderful panellists. <laughs>
Anna Maria Arabia, born in Australia, has maintained a strong bond with the Italian culture and has actively and concretely contributed to strengthen the ties and the friendship between the two countries. Her excellent professional profile, the prestige she enjoys in the vast Australian and international scientific community, her constant commitment in promoting the role of science in the society, her determination in encouraging young people to undertake scientific careers while pursuing a gender balance make her extremely worthy of receiving the recognition of the Italian Republic. So there are also other reasons behind this, namely the fact that Anna Maria, who is, um, whose first citizenship is Australian, she is an Australian citizen, first of all, and as a second uh, citizenship, she held, holds the Italian one. But, uh, you know, born here from Italian parents that do uh, migrate, actually, in, in Australia uh, in the 30s. Anna Maria Arabia has always kept a very active bond with the Italian community in many different ways. And... Uh, and, and, and then um, mm, translated, in a way, her bond, natural bond between Italy and Australia into her work. So it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to bestow to you this recognition in this place uh, at your home. So it's a great, uh, definitely a great and happy coincidence. So um, I offer you the diploma. Thank you. Thank you. And, and the two insignia. There are two different insignia with the star of Italy. The small one can be, can be used on a daily basis if you so wish. The other one, the big one, just on official occasions. So for next time for the celebration of the Italian National Day, for example. Okay. So it's a really a great pleasure for me. That's okay. It's not that easy. Things. <laughs> okay, it's complicated. It doesn't go through. <laughs> you will do it yourself. I will. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. For your really extensive and sustained uh, uh, effort to strengthen the ties between our two countries. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> May I invite Anna Maria Arabia to say some words after receiving this honor? Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Your Excellency, for those uh, very generous words and for the recognition on behalf of the Italian government. I'm genuinely honored and humbled to receive this recognition. I could never have imagined standing at the podium of the Ian Walk Theatre uh, accepting this honor. Um, I accept this award in my personal capacity rather than as Chief, Chief Executive of the Australian Academy of Science uh, because the words I'd like to say are my personal words rather than representative ones. Uh, there are many people I'd like to acknowledge, I won't name them all, um, but people who have created an environment where I've been able to forge a path and pursue my interests. I'd firstly like to thank the Italian government, so ably represented by Ambassador Tartioli. Uh, in particular, thanks to Dr. Anna Maria Fioretti uh, for her contribution to Australia and for, and for so generously nominating me for this honour. If I may, I'd like to honour my parents and sister. While they're not with us physically, I know they'd be very proud uh, to see my achievements recognised by the Italian government. Uh, they were fundamental in my upbringing and helping me gain a very deep and rich understanding of my Italian cultural heritage. 
They supported me in every way possible and in all aspects of my life. Uh, my father left Italy and his trade in Aprigliano in the province of Cosenza, and that's in, in the region of Calabria, in 1955 to travel to this faraway land and to create a better future for him and his family. And indeed he did, and I think this award is a testament to that. Um, together with my mum, they gave me, they did everything so I could be educated, um, and there's absolutely nothing that I've achieved uh, that, wouldn't, that could have been possible without their effort, determination, and without their gift of um, education. There have been many pioneers, men and women of Italian cultural heritage, who enabled the voices of Italians and other immigrants to Australia to be heard at a time when they had no voice at all. They fought for many rights that Australians enjoy today. One of those pioneers I'd like to name this evening, and I'd like to single out the late Giovanni Scrotò uh, for the impact he had on society and on me personally. He was unfortunately discriminated against and was refused Australian citizenship for many years because of his political beliefs. It wasn't until the election of the Whitlam government uh, that he was granted citizenship. And that time also saw the abolition of the white Australia policy. Giovanni went on to become Victoria's first Italian-born parliamentarian and de delivered his first speech in the Victorian Parliament in Italian. These were critical moments in the history of not just the Italian community in Australia, but the entire community. I wish I could stand here today and say that the relationship Australia has with refugees and immigrants is one we can be proud of. It is not, and there is much more that needs to be done. Giovanni Scrotò was instrumental in encouraging and enabling my active involvement in multicultural affairs in Australia and encouraging me to consider lending my voice to assist others. His efforts exemplify the importance of becoming involved in community activities, in volunteering and in working collectively to create and advance a nation that reflects us all. It was Giovanni Scrotò who enabled me to undertake scientific research in Italy in 1997. It was the first time my interests in community affairs dovetailed with my desire to create knowledge through scientific research. I undertook just a short two-month collaboration at the CNR, the Centro Nazionale di Ricerca, which professionally is akin to having a placement at CSIRO in Australia. On a personal level, it was also deeply meaningful. Daily, I caught a train to work, the same train that my father and grandfather had taken decades before me. I understood their land, my origins and myself in a way I could never have imagined. Upon my return to Australia, I was inspired to work further with the Italian community, uh, the Italian Australian community, which led to the establishment of youth groups, uh, more than a decade of voluntary work, first in the Melbourne community and then nationally. That led to representational roles with Comitas and the Consiglio Generale degli Italiani all'estero, the CGA. It wasn't obvious at the time, but that voluntary work presented an invaluable skill building opportunity. I learned about budgets and event management and how to organise people. And, per, and I personally, without knowing it at the time, learned a lot about representing people and a lot about politics. I'm so thankful for having had these opportunities in my youth. I also gained a lifetime of friendships. I was fortunate enough to undertake a further 13-month research placement at the Mario Negri Institute for Pharmacological Research in Milan in 1999. I learnt skills there that I transferred to my research laboratory in Melbourne, and that set in train important international collaborations. All of these community and scientific opportunities have si since taken me into policy development and political advisory roles, and now into senior executive management of this extraordinary institution, the Australian Academy of Science, um, whose fellows, the elected scientists, are genuinely the most remarkable and honourable people I've ever met in my life. In each of these roles, I sought to advance our nation uh, through the pursuit of knowledge and by encouraging decision makers uh, excuse me, by encouraging decision making that is informed by evidence. I've sought to create a society where science is valued, a society where parliamentarians, legislators and decision makers consult evidence to inform the way forward and in doing so strengthen our democracy and encourage rational thinking. In my years spent in advisory roles in politics, I had the tremendous privilege to investigate and analyse some of the most complex policy challenges facing this nation and use my science skills to propose ways to solve them. I learnt that policy and politics is tough 
and it's contagious too, although I don't need to tell that to a Canberra audience. It's relentless and intoxicating. It is complex, but so critically important to who we are and what we want to be as a nation. My years spent advocating on behalf of science and scientists and working in the field of science education reinforce that we must be relentless in harnessing the wonder of science that children are born with and sustain that wonder so that they attain a level of scientific literacy that allows them to make informed decisions and understand the world they live in. A level of scientific literacy that allows all of us, young and old, to interrogate the enormous volume of information before us on social media and to be able to decipher the facts from the misinformation. And my overall experience has taught me that we must be unrelenting in our pursuit of equity in our society and the promotion of diversity in the broadest of terms. These matters are not negotiables. Our economy is increasingly knowledge-based. All of the most pressing issues facing our glo our, us globally require a science and technology-based solution and the majority of our future industries will need STEM skilled professionals like the people with us today. Indeed, at the core of every future focused endeavour is science. Our national security, our sovereignty, our ability to create knowledge, industries and advance our society relies on it. Facilitating international cooperation is critical and it's an important tool of diplomacy and peaceful engagement. The wonderful science we've heard from this evening exemplify how collaboration between Italy and Australia helps everyone and may it long continue. Finally, I'd like to recognise and thank my greatest achievement, my seven-year-old son, Alessandro, who is not quite asleep in the back there, <laughs> uh, who keeps me balanced and reminds me every day why it's critical to reduce our footprint on this planet. I hope I'm instilling in him the values of education, respect, courage, equity and kindness. I hope too he can continue to explore his cultural heritage and be as enriched by, as, by it as I have been. Uh, thank you again, Ambassador, for bestowing upon me this honour. I'm truly humbled. Um, grazie di cuore. <laughs> and thank you all for so patiently listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Um, we, are, we are offering a drink and a bite to eat outside. Thank you very much. Now we, I think now we can close and also I want to say goodbye to those who are following online and it's time to, to have a drink for those who stay here.